Becky Ott has devoted much of her life to seeking justice for both everyday people and the environment. When she was 13, she read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. The book inspired her to become a marine biologist and eventually to share science by writing books for the general public to better understand our natural world. Well, in 1989, intending to spend a summer in commercial fishing, Ricky traveled to Alaska, where she witnessed firsthand the Exxon Valdez spilling millions of gallons of oil into Prince William Sound, devastating the local communities and thousands of miles of fragile coastline. In 2010, Ricky brought her expertise to the Gulf of Mexico, where she volunteered for five months to expose public health problems and BP's cover-up attempts in order to empower local residents to take action. Ricky has been featured in several documentaries, including Black Wave. Ricky draws on her academic training and experience to educate, empower, and motivate students and the general public to work towards a fossil fuel-free energy future through local solutions. She has served on several state-appointed advisory and working groups. She has testified before Congress and the Alaska State Legislature and received state and national recognition for her work. Now, there are 18 Bioneers events all across America, and Ricky just told me backstage this is her favorite one because of the great participation we have with youth in the audience and in the program. So with that, please help me welcome to Connecting for Change, Ricky Ott. Amy Goodout gave, Goodman gave me a shout out last night at dinner and totally made me more hyper than I normally am. So I got up at four o'clock this morning and completely changed my whole PowerPoint around. Um, <laughs> yesterday when I was listening to Sabamfu, I suddenly realized why there are so many people on the planet. It's because we haven't been following our passion and we didn't get it right the first time. So we were all told, go back and do it again, okay? So here we all are, and I think this time we're gonna get it right. I'm actually gonna go back to uh, Wisconsin where I grew up in the late 1960s, and I was uh, the oldest of three children. 13 years old, robins were falling out of trees, dying. And this upset my father, who was a paper salesman. And he decided, it, he was worried about his children walking to school with these great clouds of DDT, and he was worried about the robins and the other birds. My father sued the state of Wisconsin over the use of DDT, and he gave me Rachel Carson's book, <laughs> Silent Spring, which I read at 14. My father prevailed. Wisconsin was the first state to ban DDT. The rest of the nation followed suit the next year in 72, and eventually the entire world. For me, this was a lesson how one informed and passionate person can make a difference. We're going to fast forward now 16 years uh, through a bunch of schooling, um, PhD, master's, all that. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to take a little break before I go start a career. And I thought, I'll just go to Alaska for one summer. That was 26 years ago. Um, what's a marine biologist to do? I became a commercial fisher ma'am. And that's what I was doing. Uh, four years later, when uh, this happened. And I realized that I had already fallen in love with the people and the place. There was one last lesson from my father, and that lesson was that he acted on his passion. And I realized it was my turn to step up. And I decided the day that I flew over this wreck on March 24, 1989, that I was going to work upstream 
of these oil spills so that they wouldn't happen again anywhere. And for me, that meant I'd have to work to getting the nation off of fossil fuels. And I didn't realize at the time what a long, strange journey this would become. So I'm going to share with you all what we learned about oil, spilled oil. In Alaska, the buried oil on our beaches has lingered. It's still there. We just have to turn over stones, and it comes up. And that buried oil, the scientists now know, pub published much later in Science Magazine, that it, had, it didn't stop killing for decades. Uh, it's been killing fish eggs and embryos of both pink salmon and herring. And then, of course, if there's no young fish, the birds that eat the fish and the birds that eat the contaminated shellfish also die. And even this ripple effects went up to the mammals, where things like river otters um, that eat the fish and even whales uh, had effects that totally disrupted behavior of social behavior of the, of the whales. So scientists learned that these hydrocarbons, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, pass, can be passed through the food web, and that they jam cell function, reproductive function, DNA coding, immune suppression, respiratory pigments. It goes on and on and on. The killing doesn't stop. Herring, to this day, have not recovered in Prince William Sound. We don't know if they ever will and herring are the base of our food web. The herring fisheries are completely closed still to this day. Oil spill impacts on community health, individual health, also became established science after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. My community of Cordova, Alaska, became a case study in disaster trauma. It's the longest one on the planet right now. And what we learned from that is this promise about industry's promise about we will make you whole. What about the divorces, the suicides, the substance abuse, the domestic violence increases that we all saw and are still experiencing from some of this, the bankruptcies, the foreclosures, the kids that couldn't go to the colleges that they wanted to go to because their parents didn't have any money. So forget it about making a community hall. That just doesn't work. It's just something that pleases the press. Well, we began asking, oh, I forgot, this is uh, the Carver's personal story. This shame pole, by the way, was carved 18 years after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, when we were still in litigation with Exxon over trying to hold Exxon accountable to make us whole, and we eventually lost. So people in Cordova started asking this question. How did communities get corporations. How did corporations get so big that they could manipulate the legal system, the political system? What happened in America? We thought it was a democracy. Well, I didn't know the answer to that. So I uh, went to Thomas Lindsay's democracy schools and had quite an eye-opener there for a marine biologist. Um, so we're going to roll back 230 plus years now and go back to when our Constitution and Bill of Rights uh, were birthed. And back then, the early laws of our nation said, a person shall, a person shall. And corporations existed at the time, but they were charters for a group of people to do business. The trouble was, the corporate lawyers came and said, well, we're not a person, so we don't have to follow the law. They were not a very common way of doing business. Most people were in business as, uh, directly, not through a corporation. So the early laws weren't holding corporations accountable. And the early public defender said, nonsense. For the purpose of following the law, corporations will become an artificial person in the eyes of the law. The problem is our Constitution and Bill of Rights don't distinguish. They just say the word person 34 times. Natural person, artificial person. So that left our Constitution and Bill of Rights ripe for a hijack. And that hijack occurred in 1886 when after the Civil uh, War and the Civil Rights Amendment, the 14th Amendment was passed for African-American men, actually, to have equal protection under the law. But it said the word person. And 20 years later, a railroad corporation came and made a case before the Supreme Court. And basically, in a casual statement, the Supreme Court 
allowed these corporations to become equal to us under the law. And essentially what that does, here's our little corporate person, gave them a soapbox of the 14th Amendment. Corporations were persons legitimately under the law before African Americans and before women. And what that did effectively was hijack our democracy because corporations are now wielding rights only intended for humans, okay? And what this has looked like ever since this happened, so we're gonna roll forward now through 130 years. Um, so here we are with our little charters having 14th Amendment. And now, in the age of the robber barons, corporations usurp the Fifth Amendment, which is about due process under the law and about takings, compensation for property. And the Fourth Amendment, which is about protection against search and seizure. This was about tangible property. Well, in the 1970s, the corporations went after intangible property, intellectual property, money as speech. And what this, has, what this has looked like, what this means to us as Americans is now that, is now corporations are using our own laws against us. Think about the environment, the laws that protect the environment or public health or worker safety. It costs corporations to spend money to take the pollution out of the air or the water or to buy proper protection for the workers. And corporations are using their Fifth Amendment rights to argue that, that is, those laws are a takings of their future profits. They're arguing that Fourth Amendment right, they are entitled to protection when the federal government comes unannounced to their doors to check and do an inspection. They're hiding behind their Fourth Amendment rights. Polluters can't be caught. This is what's happening when corporations wield rights of people. And there's another little problem, and I think many of you probably have already noticed this, and that is that the corporate lawyers and lobbyists restructured our tax laws and our banking regulations during the 1980s and 90s, with the result being a massive fraud in mortgage and huge increases uh, well, decreases actually, in the tax rate for corporations, okay? Yeah, so what can we do? What can we do about all this? Well, um, now we're, we're still before the occupies, all right? We haven't rolled forward that far yet. Um, we're about 2008 or so, 2009. Um, and this is when I came out with my second book on the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill and decided, oh, I'm going to go on a book tour, and I'm going to rally the crowd, and we're going to move to amend the Constitution because people made law, Trump's judge made law. And the Supreme Court had totally made up corporate persons and totally made up money as speech. So let's take it back. Let's take it back. And I was in the middle of uh, starting up a national uh, grassroots coalition to move to amend the American Constitution, as my father said, boy, honey, let me know how that goes. Um, so, uh, in the middle of this, the BP well blew out in the Gulf, and I diverted um, my life down to the Gulf, initially for five months, but it became a year, all right? And um, it became a year. And the difference between the BP disaster and the Exxon Valdez disaster, I was horrified to see the increased militarization in America and the massive amounts of dumping dispersants. Massive. Um, dispersants are a toxin, like oil, it's like adding poison to poison, and it's an oil delivery mechanism. Those dispersants, um, okay, we are, we're gonna go forward a year now. The reason I have a script is so I try not to stray off it because 20 minutes is really short. Um, where we're at in the Gulf, and this is just from uh, last month, this month, is that the fishermen are pulling up fish, shrimp with no eyes. They're alive. The shrimp are carrying their eggs in their head instead of on their tails. 
The gills of fish and crabs and shrimp are clogged with oil, an oily substance, to the point where in the fish it's actually eating through the gut into the flesh. The dolphins earlier this year were aborting their babies at numbers of four to 10 times higher than in other years. What do dolphins eat, okay? Basically, the ocean is a casket, like we heard from Shiv the rap person, <laughs> whose name I just totally spaced. Um, but if we plot the dolphin deaths and the fish deaths on a map, we see that it exactly overlays where the Gulf impact was the greatest from the blowout. We are being lied to. The seabed floor around the Macondo well has been fractured. It is still leaking. Oil is still being dispersed. The planes are still flying, not only in the open ocean, but in coastal seas. Putting dispersants in the coastal environment is like dumping a toxin into a nursery. The oil is still coming ashore. It's not maybe so much visible, but guess what? All these beautiful white sand beaches where people are being told is safe, and children are playing, and people are coming, if you hit them with UV light at night, the oil and dispersant fluoresce. That's what these beaches look like at night. And people are wondering why they're getting these rashes and why they're dying. So across the coast, uh, in the Gulf, from Florida to Louisiana, um, I documented the emergence of a public health epidemic. And this public health epidemic um, had similar symptoms of people across the Gulf, respiratory problems, headaches, nausea, dizziness, fatigue, um, eye and skin irritation, those uh, symptoms in yellow are common symptoms with seven past oil spills according to the latest medical literature review. Doctors know about this. But instead, what's being, uh, these symptoms are being diagnosed in the Gulf as heat stroke, food poisoning. Um, and this is because, oh, uh, there's one more thing I want to mention. Um, the blood tests on the people, there has been hundreds of blood tests done on hundreds of people, um, and these blood tests are showing upper 95th to 100 percentile oil in their blood. So this is, and solvent, solvent from the dispersant. This is coming stri straight from the Gulf, from courtesy of BP. So why are the government and the industry denying that there's a problem? And I think that this is because that this is the Achilles heel of the fossil fuel industry. Um, is that people, oil makes people and ecosystems sick. Our government has no exit strategy off oil. We are running out of the cheap, easy fix. So that is pushing the industry into increasingly risky places. Offshore, the Arctic Ocean, tar sands. And I mean not risky to the industry because they're protected by the government, but risky to us, the people and the environment. We are being lied to about the hidden costs of our fossil fuel dependency. The Alberta Tar Sands Project is creating a barren, toxic moonscape where once was boreal forest, clean water, and healthy people. The moonscapes are being repeated in the Gulf of Alaska. There's a moonscape in Appalachia, Appalachia with a mountaintop removal. So, in August of this year, I visited Battle Creek, Michigan. How many of you remember the Enbridge pipeline spill in August of last year, not this year? That was covered up very, very quickly. You know why? That was the first tar sand spill in the United States. And this is what's happening in Battle Creek, Michigan, and it's happening in the Gulf, and it's because of oil exposure. Go ahead and play the video. This is a grand mall seizure. Somebody just happened to have this is real. I've seen this in the Gulf of Mexico as well. These are my friends. In the hallway, push the right button to the left. 
And if you watch the movies, Grasslands, Split Estate, The Big Fix, which is about the Gulf disaster, you'll see this common thread of people being sick and the government and the industry denying that this is happening. And by the way, he was at the end of the season when they got the camera on him. This is why we have to stop Embridge and these oil companies from doing this. They're having seizures and they're, they're getting sick from this tar sand oil. Please help us. Oil kills. It kills babies in the womb, it kills dolphins in the womb, and it kills people. So, why? Am I hopeful, okay? I'm hopeful because the youth who have mobilized, who mobilized to vote in a president have now learned that they need to organize. And they need to organize because the, pro the president didn't deliver on his promise of change. And our youth, I'm hopeful because those youth are being joined by 99% of the rest of us who finally woke up, present company excluded, okay? And we're finding as we get together in our common spaces all across America that we actually have a very clear vision of what it is we want. And people are learning to talk to each other and listen to each other, and I have hope, because people are finding that in a time of universal deceit, when telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act, other people hear and recognize the truth. And we're creating some very strange bedfellows with the military and the Marines, and even the old World War II vets, who have all sworn to uphold democracy, and they're realizing what's real is what's in the streets. So another reason I'm hopeful is because something really strange is happening, and it's transformative. And that is that when the power of love overcomes the love of power, people are realizing that anything is possible. And I actually asked for a quick extra minute and I threw in two slides that I actually had taken out because I've been at a couple of the Occupies and what I'm hearing from the people when I do the exercise that I'm gonna do tomorrow, skill sharing, um, that the vision that people are sharing of what they want their community to look like is actually a lot like what I've been hearing at Bioneers. And this is just out on the street. People have a very clear image of, of what a real democracy and what a livable, community looks like, okay? Um, so that's also very hopeful. And then here's the crazy part. We also are realizing what a government could look like. And I was just at Occupy New Orleans, and people down there um, are asking questions like this. So elected officials, if we even have elected officials in our future government, those elected officials would have only the same rights as us, no privileges, no retirement forever. No health care that's different than ours, the same as us, okay? But they're asking, do we even need to have elected officials? What would it look like if we just tossed them out and instead brought in councils of people in our neighborhood's smaller councils, talking circles, and that the talking circles and the councils, we would send representatives 
to different meetings and of different communities. And that if these representatives didn't represent us, we would choose a different representative for the next meeting. So that this is real participatory democracy now, not, not this elected stuff. What about the Department of Defense? What about the Pentagon? Out with it, okay? And instead, <laughs> whoa, that was a little bit too much tossing there. Whoa, okay. So, um, and instead of a Department of Peace, because we might change around the government a lot, okay? So we could have the councils be in charge of maintaining peace and order. And what about the feds? What are we gonna do with the fed? What? <laughs> yep, that's what people are saying. And instead, what do we have? We have state-owned banks and community-owned banks. This is already happening, okay? Maybe not in Louisiana where I was, but they're reaching out to dream what's possible and they're looking at what other places are doing. So Bioneers is, has, you know, the model is just, it's amazing that we've planted these seeds that are like popping up all over the place. And finally, what are we gonna do with these jokers, you know? Um, it, you know, it pretty much is true that nine people are not, no longer just interpreting the law, they're making it. I mean, come on, corporate person with human rights? And what about these things, you know, these jails, these private prisons? And, right, so here we go. Out with them, and in comes restorative justice, right? And this is what it can look like. And so, oh, forgot about this? Obviously, the corporate person goes out, right? And whatever business model we adopt, somewhere between socialism and capitalism, barter, cooperative, uh, cooperatives, um, I think the councils can handle it. Um, and last, um, I just want to say that uh, I'm hopeful because now is finally, finally, is the time for change. And it's time for us to ignite our passion and let it loose on the world. We are the change we can believe in, in solidarity and peace. <laughs>